Welcome Phil Estes, who is going to talk about containers and who is a principal engineer at Amazon. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, I mean that's uh, I guess the the story in a nutshell. We're going to talk about containers, the cloud native community, a little bit of the story of how multi-platform, multi-architecture has come to that world, uh, and I've been part of bits and pieces of that uh, directly, so hopefully if there are questions at the end, I can add some color and some interest to some of that, and uh, I got up early on the East Coast to fly here, so I will try and bring some energy and not <laughs> like be close to bedtime, because um, I know it's, it's getting toward the end of the day here, too. Um, <clears throat> I guess this is the point where everyone's supposed to boo if you're an ARM fan, but, um, <laughs> you know, in, actually today's a super interesting day because 30 years ago today I walked into IBM offices in Boca Raton, Florida to start my first post-college job. Um, but, you know, the first 15 years of that, I knew nothing but the Intel x86 architecture, every bit of software I worked on, every server we had, you know, that was just the de facto, you know, that PC era that led into on-prem data centers and then the early days of cloud. Uh, but, you know, interestingly, yeah, roughly 15 years into my career, um, I started working on Linux and I worked on distributions of Linux that were used by IBM, uh, not just servers, but also components embedded controllers for IBM mainframes and 32-bit PowerPC and SH4 and, you know, all these funky, you know, small uh, single board computers. And we were building, you know, cross-compiling Linux and Linux packaging, the kernel, um, and, and obviously tons of other people were working in this area around edge devices or automotive or, and then, you know, as Ed was noting in his talk earlier, the rise of kind of the Raspberry Pi and the hobbyist community around, you know, that brought ARM and obviously uh, cell phones and, and other edge uh, compute. And so kind of to, to bring that to the world I end up in, which is the Docker open source project in the early days of container runtimes, you know, even as early as like DockerCon 2015, there were folks like showing off you know, the Raspberry, Raspberry Pi clusters and running containers. Um, there was even a, a DockerCon hack challenge around Raspberry Pis, and people are showing off their little clusters they built. <clears throat> and Alex Ellis, who was a Docker captain uh, alongside myself and others, you know, started really getting into this, you know, sort of evangelizing the ability to run containers on non-x86. -X and so the community uh, as a whole, uh, and again, at that time I was still at IBM, was realizing this need to make it easier for people, you know, a lot of these folks were building their own container images, you know, on a Raspberry Pi or, you know, using some kind of cross compiler or, or specialized compute. Um, you know, ARM servers were not prevalent at this point. Um, and so, you know, we saw the need to bring uh, some way for container runtimes and container images to reflect that people ran on different CPU architectures, different operating systems. So stepping back a minute, I don't know how many folks have played with containers, used containers in any way. All right, so we don't need a Docker history lesson, but you know, I, I think the, the summary uh, that's most important is that container images gave us this sort of standard unit of deployment. I package up some software, I put it in a registry, um, and now I have this unit of work I can deploy somewhere. And that's, you know, sort of the power that containers brought. And Docker, you know, was a huge part of that as a startup who popularized, you know, the simple tool. I can Docker build, I can push it, I can run it. Um, and additionally, of course, they created Docker Hub, which was just... I think almost the more important part of what they created was this this ability to share images that you didn't have to create the Redis image or the uh, MySQL image or the Ubuntu or Debian. It was just there. 
uh, and you could start from that and, and you know, try things out. Um, and so alongside that, really, over those early years, we ended up with kind of this common substrate around the OCI's run C, which is the executor uh, managed by, uh, in public. So I, I'm trying to skip over a lot of potentially boring history, but you know, Docker broke up its runtime into multiple components, and run C uh, was sort of the Switzerland of, you know, there could be other runtimes, but we could all agree that run C is the executor that knows how to start a container on Linux OS, for example. Um, above that, they donated container D to the CNCF, and so that's a project I've been a maintainer of, uh, again, since, since that time when it was donated. And so above that, you know, we've kind of built this common stack of Kubernetes. There's other alternate things you can plug in at these layers. Uh, Creo from Red Hat, C Run is a, a Run C like um, in written in C from Red Hat as well. But above that, people have created other layers. Obviously, Kubernetes being almost the most common. All the Docker tools also build on these same layers. But if you think about bringing that to another architecture, so it's great that Run C is a Go program that easily compiles to almost every architecture you can you can find. Uh, Container D, we we support I think five architectures now along with Windows. But if you think about you know now I'm actually going to build uh, a system around these container runtimes and orchestrators. There's a ton of other stuff I have to think about. Oh, well, I, I'm going to use Envoy, or Kubernetes needs etcd and core DNS, or my workload is actually built on Nginx, or I use MariaDB. And so you see that the expansion of my needs for things that are built on ARM, and you know, people like Ed and others you know, labored for a long time to try and get these projects to adopt uh, ARM and, and other architectures. You know, that's been the real challenge throughout this whole period of time. So, you know, around that time you bring in, you know, the heavy hitters, the clouds that start offering ARM servers in the cloud. So, uh, you know, I won't belabor reading this all to you, but, you know, this is, I think, roughly a, a valid timeline of, of things that uh, were launched or released or, or provided through, you know, the last six years or so. And, you know, the interesting piece kind of in the middle there, and, and I was told at one point when I shared this in a more uh, formal setting that I couldn't mention that Apple Silicon has anything to do with ARM64. But let's just say it compiles pretty nicely uh, if you have a Mac with Apple Silicon. Uh, but again, there were the, sort of all these gears moving towards the availability, the uh, sort of adoption of, you know, AWS customers adopting Graviton. And, you know, to this audience, I don't, I don't think any of this is new information, but, you know, the reasoning was, you know, I get cost reduction, I get better performance, you know, energy consumption savings. And so there's been kind of this knock-on effect of, hey, if my software is available for ARM and I'm building on containers and they're available for ARM, I can now potentially save significant costs or you know, get better performance by adopting these other, you know, server uh, offerings from the major cloud providers. So coming back, back to containers, um, you know, what does that mean? Like, what did we do in 2015, 2016, 2017 to try to make this possible? And one of the first things people did is, you know, all the default uh, Docker Hub images were x86. And so, you know, people came along and said, well, I'll come up with monikers for how I name or tag an image. And it got really ugly because everyone wanted to see, is there a common scheme we can all agree on, um, you know, putting it in the tag or putting it in the name. Um, but, you know, all of these have significant uh, constraints, such as all of a sudden documentation only works on one architecture. Or I have to tell people, hey, if you're going to do this on a Raspberry Pi, always add this to the image name. You know, all those kind of ugly hacks. What we really wanted was just a way that you could, whatever runtime you're using, I'm using Docker here as an example. When I run the Nginx image, 
it, the runtime should just figure out what to do. What CPU architecture am I running on? What OS? And so that's um, what many of us worked on through, again, that same 2015-2016 era. I wrote this blog post that the text is too small, but you can go read it uh, as a history piece at this point, because uh, I'm sure a lot of it's out of date. Uh, but what we did is we designed an image format that became the OCI, the Open Container Initiative image spec, that allowed you to specify the operating system uh, architecture, the, uh, yeah, the OS and Arch, and then over time added some other variables like, you know, variants, which is important in the ARM world. Um, and so we created this new image type, uh, and that seemed like, okay, we did it. We're done. Okay, well now all the official images are still just like x86. Someone has to do the work of building these as multi-platform images. And so it was just over a year later that uh, Docker Hub was able to provide all the official images, uh, which is you know a moniker for images that Docker maintains. So it's not everything in the world, but it's many of the common images, all the major distros. Uh, they were provided as manifest lists. And that's, that's the name we used initially in Docker for the way to represent multiple architectures in an image, essentially a wrapper, and we'll look at that in a second. So it makes a little bit more sense if you haven't seen that. But the, these were kind of two significant steps to bring us to a place where I can now be on a non-x86 system, and if the image is provided, and my container runtime knows what to do, it just magically works. So I can run Docker, run Nginx, and it works just the same on ARM, or Raspberry Pi, and ARM server, x86, PowerPC, et cetera. So those, um, you know, those were important milestones. Um, you know, the Hello World is a very simple image that Docker publishes on Docker Hub just to kind of test out your installation of your runtime. It is a manifest list that supports all these platforms today. I've highlighted, of course, the ARM uh, variants. Um, someone from ARM said, hey, how come V9 isn't there? OK, we need to work on that um, as it's not uh, represented. But essentially, the OCI specs allow for this to grow to all supported architectures, including, um, I can't remember why, but Almost every official image supports Linux 386. So if you can find an old 386, you can run most Docker images on it. Um, and again, you know, there's also support for Windows, and now there's also Windows ARM support for some images as well. So this is kind of, you know, the high-level view. We'll d we'll dig in a little bit lower and see what this means that this is a manifest list. But essentially, you can run a tool like this. And you'll see that many, many images today are multi-platform like this one. So that was another piece of the puzzle, but we're still um, stuck with the fact that it's hard for people to make these images. Like, OK, I can Docker build. I can have a Docker file. I can build it on x86. Maybe I've got access to some ARM hardware. Or I have cross compilers, so I can build it for other architectures. But now I have to use another tool. Uh, so I had written a tool uh, before there were things like Docker Desktop to try and assemble images together. And the Kubernetes project and some other projects used that for a while. Uh, but it's messy, right? Because now, now you have to think about a pipeline that's building all kinds of different architecture targeted images. And then at some point, you need to have a culminator that says, oh, OK, they're all done. Now I assemble the final result as an official multi-platform image. And even today, um, you can find some, some pain points in that. Uh, if today Alpine 3.20 released a security fix and the Docker official images started their rebuild cycle, there will be a point today where Docker run Alpine 3.20 won't work on ARM because that manifest list hasn't been built yet, but maybe it's built for x86. So, you know, that's still a pain point when you think about multiple architecture building because there's nothing magic about 
the image format itself. It doesn't create images for other platforms. That's a step you have to build that pipeline and the image um, format and layout allows you to assemble them all into one image. And so at some point uh, in 2019, Docker Desktop started allowing people to build multi-arc images in one step. And so this was a significant move forward that I could now build x86 and ARM64 you know, on an Intel Mac or a Apple Silicon Mac or uh, you know, a Linux system. And it would assemble those at the same time so that the output of that build is the multi-platform image. And so I thought just to um, make that more accessible, I would show that you know, um, right here, which this is probably a little small. <laughs> um, so I've got a super simple directory here called Fossey. It's got a Docker file. It has a script uh, for build, a script for push. And the Docker file, I've, uh, let me put that near the top in case it's, um, so the Docker file just adds a simple shell script into the Docker image. It's from Alpine Latest. Um, and that script just says hello Fossey. So nothing very exciting here. Um, but I'm using a, a open source tool called Finch that our team at AWS created that is similar to Docker Desktop, has a lot of the same features. And so you'll see that my um, build command, my build script, just runs finch build dash dash platform equals AMD64 and ARM64, tag it with a, a name, image name, um, I could also do the push in one step, but I thought I'd separate them uh, just to make it clear what's happening here. So if I run that, um, yeah, there's a lot of output here. But you can see that, that build kit, the open source project that Docker and Finch and other tools use, has recognized that I'm building for two different architectures, processed the Docker file, and pulled both the Alpine for ARM64 the Alpine for x86 and assembled my image. Again, I haven't done anything very fancy because the shell script is not um, platform dependent, but obviously it wouldn't run properly if the bash interpreter was x86 only. And so this is built uh, essentially a multi-platform image with two architectures and tagged it uh, with the name I gave it. And assuming I'm connected to a network, I think I already did. Um, I can push that to my Docker Hub SSP Fossey reference. Um, maybe I'm not connected to a network. But I, I did. Um, I did push this yesterday. So in case we didn't have a good connection. Um, I'm, so it's already pushed because I, I pushed it yesterday and there's no changes to it. So we'll just, um, this is a tool that, again, just looks at that. It goes and talks to the registry and asks for the image metadata. And so if I do that for this image we just built, um, it says that it's an image index. And so when the Docker formats were standardized under the OCI. Uh, instead of calling it a manifest list, the, the idea was that index was a better name. So this is an image index. And it contains two manifest references. And so here you can see the platform for the first one and the platform for the second one. You can see each of these are of type image manifest. And each of them has the digest of the layers. One layer is the Alpine base OS image, and the other is my little run shell script. And so this is the image that was assembled, pushed to Docker Hub, and again, it contains support for both ARM64 and x86. And so if I run that image, 
and this is an Apple Silicon uh, laptop, you would expect, um, let me actually get a shell so we can prove that. Um, Oh, of course, I won't get a shell because I the entry point is um, the script. Oh, yeah. So container images can have hundreds of layers. Uh, the Docker file is what uh, really drives that. So that from line is, you know, the source image that we start from. And that could have five or ten layers, depending on who built that. And then every command in my Docker file adds another layer. Um, so, oh wow, that's really low on the screen. So I'm in. I'm at the inside that container. And so if I do a uname, uh, you can see that the VM that's running the container runtime on my Mac is basically based on Fedora Core 40 with uh, this kernel, and it's in, you know, AR64 mode. And so, oh, I think um, I don't have the file command, which would be helpful, because if we look at BusyBox, you know, we can actually see that it's an AR64 executable. So even though I ran an image index, so again, think back to that, you know, two entry index, because this is an ARCH64 CPU, the runtime chose to pull those layers that, that map to ARCH64, to ARM64 CPU architecture. So, you know, that's, that's the quote unquote magic for how multi-arch arch works in containers. Um, again, not a very exciting demo, but hopefully one that gives you an idea of like how these things are actually working. You know, what does it mean to have a multi-platform image uh, or a container image? I think that was all I was going to show. Um, I think Ed touched on this a little if you were in his talk. So, you know, that's all great. So now we have the ability to create multi-platform images. All the Docker official images are uh, available for many architectures. Um, but now coming back to sort of this cloud-native world of Kubernetes and all its associated pieces, um, it was important that each of these projects starts to think about what does it mean to support ARM64 as a a full-fledged, you know, supported architecture for this project because it's it's one thing to say, well, I can build Kubernetes for ARM64, but we really want the Kubernetes project to build and support ARM64. And so, um, you know, there so there's a ton of great blog posts you can go find each of these. Um, you know, hardware was provided. Uh, Ed talked some about that. The donations. Um, there, uh, Alex Ellis, who I talked about earlier with the Raspberry Pi in the early days of Docker, um, provided a, uh, you can go to actuated.dev, where he manages uh, some of these servers and, and provides them as GitHub runners for projects. So the Containerd project, we used actuated.dev as our entry point into um, having official CI runs on ARM64. And, um, and so this has been expanding. You know, there are, uh, if you go to actuator.dev, you'll see a list of projects that have adopted uh, CI. Kubernetes has their own framework called Prow. I'll show some of their uh, ARM64 jobs. But again, this is, you know, this is something that's ongoing. Um, I'm pretty sure you could say that, you know, there's plenty of work that still needs to be done with parity. So it's one thing to build for another architecture. It's another thing to say all my tests run exactly the same way with the same coverage. And so over the last couple of years, I've seen that, you know, growing in the CNCF and of course elsewhere as well. Um, 
So here's a few, you know, here's Kubernetes Prowl. Um, they have a container DE ARM64 run that runs uh, on every Kubernetes pull request. On the right, I've got our own container D job. So there's the actuated ARM64 jobs, building our binaries, uh, cross-building the Windows ARM, and then running all our integration tests. So that was one of the first missing pieces we had um, early on is that we found it easy to build for ARM, but we weren't doing all of the testing because some of the early hardware we had access to just would slow down our progress if a pull request took an hour to run a, the same kind of integration suite that we'd run on x86 with a higher powered machine. But that's, you know, with actuated, and then I'll talk in a minute, you know, GitHub is now uh, offering ARM64 runners as well. Um, we now can claim that we have full parity. We're running all the same tests on all the architectures that we support. And as I mentioned, so, you know, this is recent news, ARM64 on GitHub Actions. Um, you can, again, search on this, read more about it. Um, I've poked in the... <laughs> uh, yeah, July 23rd, so pretty recent. Or at least this post is. I know, in the, I, I'm never sure in the CNCF because the CNCF has organizational access to some features that I'm not sure every open source project has, but I know I went in and poked around and I could actually add an ARM64 runner uh, to our CI. So we're probably gonna transition from actuated to the ARM64 actions runners. Um, so that's work that we're doing in our project. Um, and also I, I mentioned in my abstract, uh, this is not meant to be, uh, I'm a very open source focused person. I don't sell AWS services, but uh, I did mention, you know, this, all this work that we've done has led to actual customers using ARM for production workloads on AWS. So AWS Fargate is a container service that uses Container D. That's one of the reasons I work at AWS to help them contribute upstream to Container D. And so again, here's a customer who, you know, wrote a blog post optimizing cost and performance using Graviton. Uh, Samsung gave a talk at reInvent talking about building their multi-platform Docker images so they could run on Graviton. Um, this was another customer talking about uh, transitioning all their Kafka clusters on Graviton and getting a bunch of performance improvements. And they spelled it out, you know, 75% 70, increase in throughput, lower CPU consumption, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, it's not just cloud native, you know, there's, recent blog posts around, you know, free, free BSD using Ampere servers, uh, OpenStack. Um, and, and again, all the major cloud providers now have either in some kind of preview or GA uh, availability of getting ARM, access to ARM CPU powered VMs or bare metal instances. So that's the, uh, that's the flavor I wanted to give you. I think the, the call to action could be very different for different people in the room. Um, if you're a developer who's trying to understand how do I build multi-arc containers, um, there's some great resources and I'll share these slides. I didn't know uh, how Fossey does, uh, if they have a, a vehicle to share these, but I'm happy to give a PDF to anyone. Um, so you can kind of see, um, you know, what does it mean to build and test software on ARM64? What do I have to do? How do I change my Docker files or my build process or my CI? If you're an open source project maintainer, um, you know, do you support more than x86? Uh, have you looked into what that would entail? How, you know, where do you build today? How, how do you, you know, access CI resources in your current environment? Um, do you run tests on other architectures? So, um, you know, works on ARM and actuated.dev have a bunch more information if you want to dig into that. And again, now uh, with the recent news, GitHub also has ARM64 runners that are accessible. And then, you know, again, maybe you're someone who's like, well, I, I have ARM workloads and I'm trying to figure out, you know, 
where do I get ARM instances? And there are people smarter than me here who uh, can probably tell you about way more options in this space. Um, but you know, one, I think one of the uh, difficulties here is that I've given you kind of the rosy, beautiful view of like how much we've done and how much has been accomplished. Um, I was just talking to someone in the break who was like, I tried to, you know, build a container for ARM and the image I used wasn't, didn't support it and I ended up down this rabbit hole. Um, so the honest truth is that there's a lot more to do. Obviously, there's a lot of projects that aren't aware of what it would mean to support multiple architectures or how to make sure they're testing or delivering that in some meaningful way. Uh, how they share that content, where they put these container images. So, um, again, a lot more to do, but um, I at least wanted to give you the flavor of kind of where this specific community, uh, Container D, the, the specifications around images um, are today. And so, yeah, that's it. And um, I'd love to answer questions that, that you still have. Yes. Yeah, so I, there was that um, chart with lots and lots of information. So AWS has a, a processor family called Graviton, which is an ARM64 um, implementation that has four generations now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I wish I would have. Uh, manifest list of self-testing. I struggle with everything, like finding documentation about how that works. I know it works. I know it's really hard. Is that documented somewhere? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. So, yeah, I think, I think there's, there's some easier paths, like if you're using a tool that's built around BuildKit, as, as its core, so the Docker and Containerd family of open source projects. Um, I guess what I, I think we're trying to sort of hide that complexity in a, in a sense, like you just list your platforms and magic happens and you, you end up with an image that, spo that supports multiple architectures. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a great question. I, I think, you know, as far as what it would mean to assemble an index yourself. Like that's not something a lot of people have written about or blogged about or documented. When everyone was trying to figure out, yeah, how to do it. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. I'm wondering how that might affect the index design. Do you need to come in with a bolt um, in a particular layer of RL or Yeah. Um, trying to think if there's a way to do this in a more beneficial way. Um, Trying to think if there's a visualization that would help explain this. So, kind of. Um, yeah, I guess I picked a random tag. I don't know what bookworm pearl is for internet, but you can see all the architectures it supports. Is that big enough? Um, and you can see compressed size on the right. So, the only thing we're not seeing here, I don't. We might be able to get it by clicking here and going one le level down. But when your runtime tries to fetch the metadata about this image, it is not going to fetch those layers until it's decided which of these OS Arch combinations matches your platform. Then it will pull whatever number of layers adds up to this 
you know, megabyte compressed size over here. Um, so <clears throat> multi-arch images are now larger in the sense that really they're more of a pointer into, you know, a very specific image for 386 or RMD5. Yeah, it, it'll basically read uh, read this list, find out a match, and then start pull it, pull that metadata and start pulling those layers. Can you talk more about the binge tool you're using? How that helps? Yeah. So. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, first, I'll, I'll I'll point you to runfinch.com, which has a lot more detail on Finch, but it's it's basically a clone. It's similar to Podman. So Podman is a full clone of the Docker command set built around uh, the Red Hat you know tool suite. Finch, uh, because we're already invested in Containerd and RunC in that ecosystem, we built Finch as uh, again, just a, a clone of the Docker command set that's pure open source for people that don't want, be, because at some point Docker, depending on your your usage, uh, started charging a fee. Uh, AWS had customers who asked us for uh, an open source solution, and so Finch is the result of, of that. So there, there's nothing necessarily extra magical about Finch other than it's just built on the raw components of Containerd build kit, Lima to provide the VM isolation, which is another CNCF project, uh, and NerdCTL, which is the Docker command line interface built on Containerd. Uh, yeah, so it's it's out there if, if you're interested in trying it, but it's it's just another path to the Docker like command set. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I mean, honestly, Docker and Docker has been a super popular way for people. A lot of CI systems have been Docker and Docker to have like this isolation. So Finch can run Docker inside of it. Uh, Finch can't necessarily run Finch because the most people want the in, inside isolation to have the Docker API. That's the whole point. Um, but yeah, I guess we have Docker and Container D as a similar architectural style to that. But there's no default image built for that, I guess, is the very direct answer to your question. Yeah, yeah, there, there is not. That's an interesting thought. Yep? You mentioned, you mentioned at some point performance being something that was documented. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I probably should have augmented that and said that, you know, beyond, I mean, there is the performance characteristic aspect, but, um, you know, there was a group providing, uh, I think it was built on OpenStack, uh, maybe one of the Chinese cloud providers, uh, were providing free ARM uh, access to open source projects. And so we were using that because we had no other path to ARM access uh, for CI for container D. Um, so there was a performance characteristic problem in, in that you don't want your pull request to take twice as long to run all the tests. Uh, but there was also a flakiness factor in that we had no, uh, I mean, they were doing their best to kind of keep this sort of uh, self-managed infrastructure running, but it's a pain when you're trying to put out a release and it's like, well, we can't get the ARM tests to run because for some reason the VMs are down. Uh, so, so that, you know, that was a big part of it as well, which, you know, actuated and now, you know, GitHub having ARM runners, like stability is, a, is kind of a key component of, of saying, I want to support another architecture as long as I can get stable, uh, sufficient access to resources 
for testing. Cool. Did you mean to turn the screen off? No, I didn't. Uh, I guess, oh, I'm not plugged in, so it timed out. Um, yeah, thanks so much.